tired and I'm exhausted and Marley's even more tired and on that note I want to formally thank Marley Lightfoot for actually putting this symposium together. <clears throat> She has been magnificent on details and it's not something that turns me on. So I had a big concept and we put it together. Um, I did this for two reasons. One, that I was so annoyed and frustrated with the arrogance and ignorance of the media about radiation biology after Fukushima, especially with one George Monbiot at The Guardian who knew nothing about internal emitters or anything, and they, and they kept saying people haven't dropped dead, and they're still saying that. That I thought it was appropriate to sort of set up a medical conference for two days, like medical school, to teach them the basic elements of radiation biology. And that's why I put this symposium together to educate the media. Unfortunately, there were representatives here, but we could have had a lot more, so they're not really quite turned on to it yet. And I suppose I have to say that uh, the American media really worries about Americans, like a little girl trapped down a well or that sort of thing. Um, and it was interesting to note that when the sailors came along, that very was very pertinent because they're Americans. And I don't think people can extrapolate too much in this country to Japanese. Number one. And number two, when Chernobyl happened, I can remember being on a telephone in the Texas airport talking to an ABC radio commentator um, who said, well, they're just Russians. <laughs> and I was absolutely flabbergasted. I said, I'm a physician and every human life is precious. So that attitude of insularity uh, prevails, and it's prevailed today. Not amongst you, but amongst the media, and this is the sort of capital of the media, of, of certainly the United States, and in fact the world, because this is where the United Nations is situated, and there are media representatives from all over the world. And we're in a very serious situation. Um, I want to, uh, Arjun Makajani, who's been referred to several times, has written a note that he wants read, and I will do that. But I want to say that I held a symposium called Nuclear Power and Global Warming, I don't know, about seven years ago, and David Freeman was there. And we had scientists from all perspectives for nuclear power against nuclear power for two days. It was an excellent conference. And at the end, David Freeman, who I'd never met before, stood up and said, we can get all the energy we need in the United States with no carbon and no nuclear. And I said, David, you're kidding. I mean, couldn't believe it. He said, yes, we can. So I then raised the money and commissioned Arjun to do a study. He was skeptical too. He's a physicist. And he came out with a study which is absolutely remarkable called Carbon Free, Nuclear Free, where it showed that in fact by, well he said 2050, but it's now 2030, but it's probably sooner than that, America could be carbon free, nuclear free. And we owe that study to David's vision that he's had ever since, you know, he was with Jimmy Carter and, and Nixon. So I want to honour David for this vision. And on that note, I would say that when America was attacked at Pearl Harbor, by God, it only took about nine months to convert every single industry into making weapons. You can't tell me that we can't do that within nine months to a year. To convert, you know, convert all these industries into making solar panels, put them on every single house in America, like in Germany. I saw them all over Austria. Germany gets not much sun, but you don't need much sun to generate solar power. Have windmills all over the country. As mentioned, there's enough, there's three times, the, there's enough wind west of the Mississippi to supply three times the energy this country currently needs. We need to upgrade the grids. Easy. 
Where is the FDR that will lead us towards sanity and survival? I see that not happening in this Congress, who are pathetic. I see it not happening with Obama, who's now become a captive and maybe always was, of the corporations. So how do we have a revolution to stimulate that? Well, let me tell you about a revolution that we had in the 80s. When I first came here in 1978, almost every American I spoke to said it's better to be dead than red. I said, what? What? And they said, no, we don't want to be communists. And I said, well, what about the pygmies in Africa? And they said, this is true. They don't want to be communists either. And they would rather have a nuclear war than be communists. And it was a mass psychosis. This country was psychotic. <laughs> anyway, so I thought this is crazy. So I got together physicians for social responsibility and we recruited 23,000 doctors and we had 153 chapters and I taught them how to go on the media and talk about this and write letters and op-ed pieces and we literally deluged the media with the medical consequences of nuclear war which started with a symposium at Harvard um, where we had wonderful faculty, including many of the old fellows from the Manhattan Project, Vicky Kisiakowski, uh, no, George Kisiakowski, Vicky Weiskopf, Philip, what's his name, Philip? Yes. No, anyway, I can't remember. Morrison, yeah. Um, and they talked about their guilt, really, of building nuclear weapons, and a lot of them were dedicated to nuclear power because they thought that would fix things and alleviate their guilt. But they all went to their graves feeling tremendous guilt. And these symposia were interesting because afterwards the media said, well, what, what are doctors talking about nuclear war for? That's political. And we said, no, actually, it's medical. That nuclear war will create the final epidemic of the human race and they started to buy it. And the Archbishop of Boston would get up in the morning and there'd be in the Boston Globe a map of Boston with concentric circles of destruction, vaporization out to five miles of everyone, third degree burns out to 20 miles, a holocaust of 3,000 square miles burning, and, and the Archbishop would say, I don't think Jesus would like this. And then we went around to most capital cities where we had symposia. People were scalping tickets to the University in Seattle. We had a huge one in Los Angeles, and we got a lot of media attention, and people started to think about it. So that after only about going two years for this, and I had an agent in Hollywood who worked for me for free, and they didn't, in, in, the media didn't want to put on a boring doctor, Australian doctor in a tweed suit talking about the medical effects of nuclear war. I mean, that would turn everyone off and then they wouldn't buy their hemorrhoid cream or their stuff to stick their false teeth on the top of their mouth or this pill for erectile dysfunction. You have to keep the audience happy in order to buy the stuff that they advertise. So she'd say, look, I'll give you Lily Tomlin and Sally Field if you'll take Helen Caldicott. So they liked that. They were the sort of hook to hang me on. Anyway, I'll tell you the first time, I, I think I did Donahue for an hour, and Lily, I got in there, and Lily's pacing up and down the corridor, she's very smart, reading these notes so that she could go on and talk about it. Sally sat there having a hair curled and a face all fixed up. By the time I got on in half an hour, Lily had covered the whole waterfront. She'd done the whole thing. But it was a wonderful way to educate the people, and that's what we did in PSR. We created a revolution so that by the end of five years, from most people supporting the concept of better dead than red, 80% of Americans were opposed to nuclear war. And I met with Reagan in the White House and quickly established a doctor-patient relationship with him and held, <laughs> held his hand and we went on for an hour and a quarter and I estimated his IQ to be sort of average 100. And I actually came out and said I thought he had impending Alzheimer's, which he did. But it was interesting because I thought I got nowhere with the man and he didn't understand anything. His figures were inaccurate. He didn't understand the technology. Um, but after that, he started to say nuclear war must never be fought and can never be won. And he started working with Gorbachev, who saw doctors 
on Moscow television talking about the medical effects of nuclear war, which turned Gorbachev around. Um, we got a million people in Central Park, black lesbians from Harlem, Southern Christian Baptists, Mormons from Salt Lake City, everyone marched in and in and in. It took all day to get a million people in Central Park. The biggest demonstration, I think, in the history of this country. Then they did an end run around us and started talking about, this was Reagan, war in space, Star Wars, missile defense, all of that stuff. You know, he had a yellow shield over America and the missiles would go boink, boink. That's what he thought would help America. But we became so powerful that uh, the whole of the American population was supporting an end to nuclear weapons. And so then the Cold War ended, which was a result of our work and Gorbachev understanding the medical effects of nuclear war. Now, that was the second American Revolution, for sure. It was sagacious, peaceful, Gandhian, and it was education which did the trick. So how are we going, and, and I'd go into Congress and Tip O'Neill, who's a lovely fellow from Boston, he'd come out and say, well, he, he was chairing the House, and he'd come out and say, what can I do for you, doctor? Because he knew we had 80% of people behind us, and that's political power. That is political power. And I'd say, Tip, I want you to play our film, The Last Epidemic, on every TV monitor in the Congress, and he did it. And when Tip, um, retired, he said the two most important things he ever did in Congress was the nuclear weapons freeze, which passed, Ed Markey and I worked on that, and also the Mary Noll nuns who he, he uh, championed, who were killed in Central America. So the only way to turn this country upside down, as Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. Now you see these kids on their cell phones, tweeting and twittering and walking along, emailing each other and stuff. They're not reading papers, they're not, not watching the news, they do not understand the nuclear age which they are inheriting. They are inheriting massive quantities of radioactive waste which will leak in the future, get into the food supply, and over time induce epidemics of cancer, leukemia, and genetic disease, congenital malformations, forevermore. You can imagine our descendants waking up in the morning. The food already radioactive, the breast milk radioactive, the babies being born deformed because they're exposed to radiation in utero, which we heard from Dr. Wurtelecki, um, and getting cancer at the age of six because they're ex exposed very early, or in utero. That's the heritage we leave to our descendants. And we can talk till the cows come home about nuclear accidents, which is severe. But the most important issue is this radioactive waste piling up all over the world and no one knows where to put it, and we don't know where to put it, and we never will. And I've been debating with the nuclear industry for 42 years, and they say, don't worry, we're good scientists, we'll find the answer to radioactive waste. They haven't attended to it. I mean, they're like surgeons, you know. We don't clean up after us, we just let the nurses clean up. We're not interested in the waste we create. We're arrogant. Well, so are they. They're interested in building bombs and designing nuclear power. It's all very exciting. So. I, I say to them, well, that's like me saying to a patient, I'm sorry, but you have pancreatic cancer, that's what the CT scan shows, and your prognosis is probably six months, but don't worry, I'm a very good doctor. In 20 years' time, I'll find the cure. But there will never be a cure to the storage of radioactive waste. So we're in a very, very, very serious predicament, and as Tim Rousseau's work shows that we're not the only ones with genes and who get congenital malformations. All plants and animals have genes, and what we're doing with this radioactive waste or when it leaks out from reactors or whatever is producing random compulsory genetic engineering forevermore. Almost all mutations in genes are deleterious and create disease, although radiation did cause evolution, so fish develop lungs and birds develop wings, and this incredible creature, us, evolved. I think we're an evolutionary aberrant, actually. 
the, the thing is that most mutations are deleterious, and I've said for years, you know, we all carry several hundred deleterious mutations in our genes, and I, <laughs> I've been parading around platforms forever, and I've just found out I'm a carrier of a disease called hemochromatosis, which is a Mendelian recessive, and my ex-husband carries a gene, and our son has just been diagnosed with hemochromatosis, which is an aberration in iron metabolism and storage, so you can't excrete your iron, and it gets stored in the heart muscle and the liver, and it can do, do very nasty things. He gets treated by being bled a litre or two or three litres every couple of months, and his iron level has come down. Now, there's been no sign of genetic abnormalities post Hiroshima. You know, it can take 20 generations for recessive genes to express themselves. 20 generations until two genes get together for diabetes, cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria, inborn errors of metabolism. There are over 2,600 diseases we have now described that are genetically inherited. Not many are dominant in other words, appearing in the next generation, except achondroplastic dwarfs, they do that's dominant. And I saw a family at Harvard, at Children's Hospital, the mother was an achondroplastic dwarf, the father was normal. They were followed by six children, five of whom were achondroplastic dwarfs. So it's a toss of the coin each time there's a conception. Many dominant uh, genes are lethal and the, ch the babies are aborted. Um, most mutations are recessive, and because we won't be alive to see what's going to happen to us, we don't know. We say we don't know. But if you look at Muller's experiments with Drosophila fruit fly in 27, he irradiated the Drosophila and they reproduce every few days, so you've got hundreds of generations and you can watch the progression of a gene that in induced a crooked wing being passed on generation to generation to generation. That's genomic progression. We've known it forever. We got the Nobel Prize for it. I learned it in medical school in 1956. We know. And so, oh, we're not seeing it in the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We don't expect to see it. That's a silly thing to even say, medically speaking. So, we're, we're facing uh, I guess, the end of the earth, life on the planet. I said once to Carl Sagan, do you think there's any other life in the universe? He paused for a long time and then he said no. And I said, why not? And he said, because if any species had reached our stage of evolution, they would have destroyed themselves. So here we are with global warming upon us. We've had the hottest days in Australia we've ever had. It was a day of 120 or 124 degrees the other day. I thought I was going to die. We're in the middle of a forest of eucalyptus trees which explode with the heat. The fires jump miles as cinders fall down. There was a fire 35 kilometres from us. The wind was blowing at 100 k an hour towards us. We had our bags packed, uh, you know, photographs, passports and everything ready to evacuate and the house would have gone. It's terrifying. And so not only did we have bushfires all over Tasmania and houses lost, people killed, and New South Wales with these awful heat waves, now we've had floods, huge floods in Queensland, people dying, being swept away in their cars. This is global warming. And I wrote about it in 1991 in If You Love This Planet, and these predictions were all there at that time. And stupidly, I thought, everyone will read the book, and they'll fix it. Meanwhile, we're exporting coal from Australia like there's no tomorrow to China. They can hardly breathe over there. I've often said, you know, people buy water in bottles, plastic bottles that contain BPA and phthalates, which are carcinogenic and hormone mimickers. Water comes out of a tap, not out of a plastic bottle. There's an island in the Pacific twice the size of Texas made of plastic. It breaks down to little pieces, the fish feed on it, the birds eat the fish, they also eat the plastic, the albatrosses are feeding it to their babies, they're dying. And still we make more plastic and more plastic and more plastic and more plastic and we never think about it. But that's kind of beside the point. Uh, so I've always said, well, soon it'll be bad enough, we'll be buying oxygen bottles to breathe. Well, that's what they're doing now in Beijing. Oxygen bottles. We're really mad. 
So, as, as David said, we have to stop burning coal now. This fracking is crazy because, as he pointed out, it gets to about 90% because I'm sure more than 2% leaks from those fracking wells. Coal, oil, oil. Everyone's driving these great big tanks and they drive their little girls to ballet in tanks. I once asked a GM man, what the hell do you think you're doing? He said, well, we're making money. So the, the true God in this country now is money. Let's be frank, Frank. It's not God. No one really believes in God. They just believe in making more money. Oh, they go to church to solve their consciences or the synagogue, but it's money. Money doesn't make the world go round. Money's killing the earth. I go back to what Mary said today, you know, 51, 52% of us are women and we're wimps and we take no stand. We have the babies, we've got the hormones to nurture life, oxytocin, progesterone, estrogen, yet we stand back and let the men proceed. Look at the Congress, full of silly men, you know, trying to <laughs> outlaw abortion and birth control and mammograms. And I mean, how dare they? And they have no right. And where are we? Nowhere. So we can fix global warming. We can stop mining coal. We can stop fracking. And we can stop, you know, we can, as David said, all parking lots in, in America should be covered with solar panels and electric cars to plug in. So we've got electric cars. Um, I've just been in California. There are hardly any solar panels on the houses. Every house in America should be solarized. And you can't tell me that uh, Americans are not smart. That's how you got rich in the first place. Yeah, you had some natural resources. But you've got a lot of ingenuity. But now all your jobs have gone to China. You don't buy anything here that's made in America. It's all made in China. So no wonder there are no jobs. But by God, could you get going? You could really show the earth what an energy responsible nation will do and become the energy superpower of the world easily. And it's true that we waste up to 30% of the electricity. Well, you do, you leave everything on all the time. Sense of entitlement is ama amazing. And in Australia, we have to switch a switch off, to, but you don't tend to pull your plugs out. So we can say, I mean, if everyone stopped using clothes dryers, you'd save almost the same amount or a bit less than nuclear power producers. Clothes dryers made by General Electric that makes nuclear power plants, so you've got to have a clothes dryer to use the electricity that they want to sell you, and they make nuclear weapons as well. I've never used, I don't use clothes dryers, I hang my clothes in the sun. But there's a law in Atlanta that you can't do that because Mrs. Brown next door might see your brassiers and your underpants. <laughs> and that's kind of rude. How ridiculous, how ridiculous. And dry them by the side the, the furnace in the winter. You know, it's simple, so easy. I ask people where their electricity comes from. They haven't a clue. You walk in those doors like that, the global warming doors or the carcinogenic doors. We need to think about the way we live. We don't walk upstairs, we take an es escalator, global warming escalator. So we're killing ourselves to kill ourselves better. So we can fix global warming and we need to have, we need to educate people through the media. The media is determining the fate of the earth. Similarly, we can close all the reactors down. There's so much data and evidence we need to get the doctors in particular in the media again, teaching people the medical consequences of nuclear power. And lastly, America and Russia owe 97% of the hydrogen bombs in the world. They've each got about a thousand on hair trigger alert, three minutes decision time by Reagan, uh, not Reagan, who is he? Obama and Putin. The Chinese are hacking into the early warning system. They get a, a thousand legitimate hackers a day. I don't know how we're still here. Why are they still threatening to blow up the planet? Well, that's, the, that's what we've got to look at, the etiology. What is the cause of these aberrant behaviours? And it's psychological. It's not how many bombs there are. And, you know, we tend to count money, and we count bombs, and we count radioactive waste and everything. Let's look at the psychology that determines, or the pathology that is determining these situations. We can abolish nuclear weapons. Obama needs our help. 
But Americans have become so passive. Now, when I say you spend a trillion dollars on killing, socialised killing, which it is in the Pentagon, socialised killing, and you don't even have a free medical care system? In Australia, it's free. You can go to hospital, have a decent operation, anaesthetic, stay for six days, costs nothing. That's called a civilised society, yeah. right? Well, so we've got to get moving, but the most important thing is to get people like David on the television, blasting the hell out of everyone, <laughs> and maybe Herb to provide a bit of theatre, um, and, to, and to teach people what's going on. And, and the doctors need to step up to the plate because this, this situation, nuclear war will create the final epidemic of the human race, so will global warming within this century, and nuclear power for the rest of time. The Earth is in the intensive care unit gravely ill, and we are all physicians now to the dying planet. And unless we move and dedicate our total life to saving it, we leave our children nothing. And I think it's terribly important to get down to where we really live, where we, who do we really love, what would we do to save our child? Will we dedicate our lives like a lioness or a lion protecting the cubs? Forget about all the data and the figures and stuff. Listen to your intuition and you'll know what you've got to do. Um, I'll just read what Arjun said. He said a few things I'm not reading. The Japanese government proposed to allow doses as high as two REMs per year to school children, claiming the risk was low or at least tolerable. An exposure at this level over five years, 10 REMs in all to a girl, starting at age five, would create a cancer incidence of about 3% using the risk estimates in the Bear 7 report. Now imagine you're a parent in Japan trying to decide whether to send your daughter to such a school. Roughly 30% of every 100 girls would eventually develop cancer at some point in their lives. 30. Just one of those would be attributable to Fu Fukushima school exposure, according to the Bear 7 report. But no one would know if their daughter's cancer was attributed, attributable to the exposure at school. Neither would they understand the, the gov Japanese government's radiation bureaucrats. Why is it difficult to understand... Um, that while the risk attributable to school contamination would be 1 in 30, the proportion of parents stricken with guilt and doubt would be closer to 1 in 3. Would you ever forgive yourself if you made the decision to send your daughter to that school or your son, though the risk attribution to Fukushima may be less than experienced by the girls? This is for the boys. Indeed, due to the long latency period of most cancers, you would be fearful even if no cancer had yet appeared. The Pentagon understood this when a Joint Chiefs of Staff task force evaluated the extensive contamination produced by the July 1946 underground nuclear bomb test, Test Baker at Bikini, for its usefulness in war. Here's a quote from their 1947 report. Of the survivors in the contaminated areas, some would be doomed by radiation sickness in hours some in days, some in years. But these areas, irregular in size and shape, this is a government, as wind and topography might form them, would have no visible boundaries. No survivor could be certain he was not amongst the doomed. And so added to every terror of the moment, thousands would be stricken with a fear of death and the uncertainty of its time of arrival, which is what's happening in Fukushima and, of course, around Chernobyl. Compare this for yourself with the aftermath of Fukushima and the plight of parents. Second, nuclear power's conceit was that nuclear power's 24-7 electricity supply. And then he talks about the ability to use uh, other sources. We can do better than making plutonium just to boil water or polluting your earth with fossil fuel use. When I finished carbon-free, nuclear-free in 2007, I estimated it would take about 40 years to get to an affordable, fully renewable energy system if we start now. Finally, I, today I think it can be done in 25 to 30 years, but we can do it much sooner, 10. Finally, are we up to the challenge? 
Finally, I truly regret I cannot be there to publicly thank and honour me for inspiring Carbon Free and Nuclear Free, which David actually did, which you can now download free from IEER.org. Uh, I wish you a very productive conference. So I just want to give you a picture of how dire the situation is, how we stay up all night with a dying patient. And we don't even think about tiredness until we hit the wall at 2 a.m. and have to have a hamburger and a milkshake. But you don't think about yourself when you're treating patients. So we mustn't think about ourselves or our lives when we're trying to save the planet. The only life in the universe, probably. The responsibility is so huge. And I wouldn't talk like this unless I knew there were answers. Abolish the nuclear weapons now. Close down all those reactors now and stop burning fossil fuel now and fill the country up with, with solar and wind and geothermal and conservation and it would make the Americans so proud. They need to be proud of something now. And that, that revolution has to come from you. Huh? Because I'm 75, I'll probably be dead soon. Okay. So, uh, look, I want to thank all the people who presented. I think it's been a magnificent conference, actually far beyond my expectations. Um, and I want to thank all the volunteers who helped enormously, and to the Manhattan Project, to PSR for co-sponsoring it, and my very dear colleagues. And uh, it will, the proceedings will be published in a book published by the New Press. Um, as we, in the next, I don't know, six months or so, so it will be down on the record. But I welcome your, now, your own initiatives to do what you must do individually to save the planet. And I want to also um, honour Alexei Yablokov, who has provided such an enormous amount of important data. Okay, now you can all go and have a drink of wine.